Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And today we're going to be talking about a book that is about one of my personal favorite periods in art history. Uh, this is what I did do my undergraduate degree on, uh, Romanticism. Uh, the title of this book, which was one of my high school, one of my university textbooks, is, you know, Romanticism. David Blaney Brown is the author. Um, this is, by the way, the second time that I'm trying to do this because I have a lot of pictures to run through and I ran out of time before I could go through them. And, uh, you know, I did my undergrad on it, so I kind of like talking about this stuff to an extent. Um, you know, uh, so there's that. If you want to know uh, details about the paintings and one sculpture and prints, the, the stuff that I have in here, uh, I have... I have references of artist title and date in uh, the description. So uh, this is uh, Caspar Friedrich's Wander Above the Mists in the on the cover uh, because it kind of exemplifies a lot of lines of romantic art and thought. Uh, the artist as important interpreter of deeper meaning the art of landscape, uh, it being Friedrich, there's always a strong undertow of religion because that was a strong undertow of that in Friedrich. Um, and of course, emotion, because the art of sublime is inextricably bound up with emotion. Anyways, uh, I'm going to try to record this a second time. Uh, you will never hear the first one because like, I basically just ran out of my personally allotted 15 minutes, and I'm not going to go over that even if I like talking too much. So, uh, this first painting is actually not romantic. This is classical. This is Jacques-Louis David's uh, Oath of the Horatii, which was a painting made immediately preceding the French Revolution, and is considered one of the quintessential representatives of classical art, which is the art period that came immediately before Romanticism. Now, uh, I'm going to put in a sidebar for anybody who has comments about romanticism from the perspective of music or literature that I'm sticking to talking about art history because, first of all, I don't have that tight a grasp on the physical characteristics that make up uh, the the physical characteristic the sort of the characteristics that make up romantic art in areas outside of the visual arts. Um, and also, I can't pull up names off the top of my head with any certainty. So, whatever I'm describing, kind of stick it in, you know, with, you know, stick a pin in it if you're going to be looking into romanticism outside of the visual arts and, you know, take it with a grain of salt in terms of interpretation. Now, classical art, uh, the sort of the evolution after all of because the renaissance was sort of a reversion a rediscovery of greek and roman stuff and the uh renaissance uh, it had this sort of determination to create a rational world peopled by rational people that's where we get the enlightenment um the thing about the Enlightenment leading up to classicism was that it was about rationality and logic, and that's the thing about this painting, is you can see how very tight it is, how clean the lines are, how the brush strokes are more or less invisible, uh, how as it's, it's very, very tightly composed, and everyone in it is effectively calm and, and intentionally uh, projecting something that is not, uh, that is not highly hyper-emotional. Um, because emotion and dramatics are at the center of Romanticism. This is Eugène Delacroix's, uh, Death of Sardanapalus, and you can see how this is just a writhing mass of screaming. I mean, there are concubines being murdered, there is smoke 
billowing in the background. There are people screaming and leaping, and you can see a horse in the front. And the only calm person here is Sardanapalus on his big bed, as he is apparently going to die shortly. And the thing about this is that there's, there is moral dissolution represented. There is the worst of the human condition, the worst of human behavior. And you can see how it is composed to be just moving in all directions. Um, you can see how the painting is much less tight, how everything is a little bit fuzzier around the edges, and that's not just the quality of my scan, although it is a little bit that. You compare the two and you can see how very, very different the style of painting is, and Delacroix is considered the quintessential romantic. It's not a title he himself particularly likes, but he's one of those people who really, really drove home this, this grasping of high drama and melodrama and action and feeling. Um, keep in mind, it's called Romanticism precisely because while, you know, representing these lows of human behavior, uh, you know, is realism in its way, it's also very, very hyper-dramatic, and the style to follow this, called realism, tended to be much less dramatic, precisely because it was about representing the human condition as it is in the moment in front of them, and human condition, most of the time, is not this dramatic, actually. Uh... This also saw the rise, at least within this book, we are told this, the rise of the concept of the starving artist in the garret, of the artist who is not understood in their own time, of the artist uh, who, you know, in this case, the death of Chatterton, uh, you have a painting here of a young man who has killed himself, uh, according to this book, the real Chatterton was a hack and a forger, but that what you have here is the martyring of somebody who could be termed an artist to stand in for all of those artists who don't feel understood in their own time, who are trying to do things with their art, as opposed to just paint stayed paintings of history and paint portraits, that what you have here is meant to be representative of all of that high-strung artist as interpreter of deeper meaning and called by God to a path. Um, there's a lot of talk in this chapter about, about that concept of artists who feel that God has called them to the path in, in much the same way that a priest is supposed to be called the priesthood. So there's that. The chapter after is about heroes, and while uh, Hannibal crossing the Alps uh, with his army by Turner is not something that is hyper-focused on an individual, uh, Hannibal is somewhere down there riding an elephant. Um, what you have in this is the notion of somebody who is pitting himself against the elements, against the weather in the Alps, against everything nature can bring to bear against him, and it's a very, very dramatic concept. It's something that goes hand in hand with the dramatic concept of Napoleon as a great leader, which was something that was going around a lot in France, though Turner being English had was less enthused about uh, Napoleon. But this, this cult of heroes, of individuals doing heroic things, informs a lot of these paintings. Again, it's about drama and excitement and, and writhing masses of emotion. Uh, there was a return to religion and a revival of the concept of the landscape painting, of landscape painting being seen as more than just, in effect, a photograph to show you what the land looks like around there, that instead to say you can use landscape to transmit more to people. So what you have here is Caspar Friedrich, uh, one of my all-time personal favorite painters, who was a German romantic painter, and what he's... you have a crucifix, there is a man 
on the cross that is on top of this mountain to the front and you have this you have this crucifix out in mourning in the Riesenberga, I believe is the title. Pardon my uh, complete lack of German. Um, and what you're trying to get at here is just this concept of God and how God appears to people in the infinity, in the sizableness, in the amazingness of nature and how nature can mean more than just something that you put people in. Uh, so it's an important line of discussion. There is the line of history because a lot of people started looking back to history, not merely to uh, not merely to the Greeks and Romans, but there was a movement in particular uh, led by people like Augustus Welby Pugin who made this particular print, which is part of a collection of prints that are comparing the present, or the then present in the 1800s, uh, with the medieval period, because they believed that the medieval period, they had an extremely rosy view of history, they believed that the medieval period was better uh, than the present, morally better, ethically better, all of these things, because the Gothic art and architecture was art created by Christians for Christians. It wasn't art referencing Roman or Greek or anything. It had been invented, as I said, by Christians for Christians, and it stood as representative of, of, of how much better things were back in the day, you know, that, that thing. Uh, Pugin is, is a thing in and of himself, and I could talk about him for a while too, but we're going to skip on before I get distracted. There was also, with the expansion of the European worldview, because of course in the 1500s you have the expansion into the New World, you have the expansion with uh, all, all of these, uh, with the English and the French and the Dutch uh, companies that uh, you had all these people, these countries that were trying to expand outward and take over these new places, and this created a tremendous lure of the exotic as it became, as transportation became easier, as people wanted their worlds to get bigger. And this painting is part of it. This is, and I quote, uh, uh, the widow of an Indian chief mourning his death. Uh, yes, Indian, because they were called Indians back then. Uh, I am not going to recontextualize the title. Its title is what its title is. Um, and you can see here, this, this is a portrait of the exotic and the strange and the far away from that strange new world. But there is a beautiful, quiet dignity to this woman who is mourning her husband's death. And part of this lure of the exotic was about connecting with, you know, with the noble savage concept, but also just capturing the idea that you have these people from far away who are still people, that there is a value in their perspectives and their cultures. There was a lot of cultural appropriation, uh, of course, and Orientalism, but at the same time, the concept of the multicultural society that we enjoy today springs out of these concepts nonetheless. Uh, I, I bring William Blake here for a representative from the chapter about explorations of the unconscious, because this is... William Blake was a crazy man, frequently, and he wrote a lot of poetry, which is why I picked this, because he's got a lot of his writing on this page. The writing isn't much discussed in this book, precisely because this book is about visual arts, uh, but it bears mentioning. And you can see how this, this is like, this is nuts, and, and an exploration of internal life. Uh, and last, uh, 
we are going to just end on this Canova one, uh, and this Canova sculpture of Mary uh, of Mary Magdalene uh, contemplating things. And I think I'm just going to call it a day. See you all next week. <laughs>